Welcome to the Art and Science of Difficult Conversations. I'm Chris. And I'm Lucy, and we love having difficult conversations. That's right. And each week, we'll either share a tip, hear how others have gotten better at difficult conversations, or demonstrate common difficult conversations and what to do and what not to do. Let's get into it. I'm so excited to have you, and I'm excited to have my guest, Michael Whistler, a uh, award-winning filmmaker, a science fiction author, dear friend, philosopher, thought partner, collaborator, all the other errors you can think of, um, <laughs> as well as the host of his own podcast. He's got a podcast that I've guested on, so there's a real melding of, of minds here, Exploring Tomorrow, which is about science fiction, especially science fiction uh, movies, books, all that kind of stuff. So, Michael, yeah. thanks for being on my podcast. Oh, uh, i uh... It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, yeah, looking forward to chatting this evening. It'll be great. So you and I connected over because we love movies. We love mm. storytelling in general, uh, and you've been able to make it a career. You know, so how did you get into storytelling as as an author and a creator? Yeah, um, I mean, it started pretty early in life in the sense that um, I got. I became really fascinated and enamored with uh, stories and science fiction stories in particular. I remember well, Jurassic Park was a particular pivotal mm. moment in my childhood, seeing that in, in the movie theaters and uh, just being captivated. I was already sort of prone to like loving movies and uh, really enjoying sort of that uh, medium of, and, and the immersive quality of getting into a story through that. But the Jurassic Park in particular had this uh, impact of really getting me to want to figure out um, how to do that kind of uh, work, how to, how to like be part of that. Um, and then interestingly enough, uh, my route to really getting more into storytelling was that a uh, friend, uh, an older friend of mine, uh, where I was living at the time, where where I grew up in in South America in Brazil, uh, he was telling me about the book that Michael Crichton wrote, that you know the movie is based on, and uh, was telling me more about like chaos theory and all this stuff, and just and it got me really interested. So I sat down and I read the book. So the first time I ever read Jurassic Park was actually in Portuguese, a Portuguese translation of it, and uh, it was a it was a you know, as a kid, I kind of struggled to really get into books and really find much interest in that. Um, but I tore through that. And and then, and that was like a pivotal moment where I was like, oh, I like this. Like, and I'd like to do stuff like this. Um, and so I, I started like writing my own stuff even as a kid and uh, starting, you know, to... to play with the medium of storytelling and even even as uh i played with my friends a lot of the play that we did was very storytelling oriented so we invented characters mm -hmm. for ourselves and we went through all these crazy scenarios and you know and we would have like th like things that we were doing would actually have conclusions where it was like okay yeah we did this and this is where the characters are at at this point and that's the end of that. What do you want to do next? You know, uh, so those like that that world started to come together for me with with um, experiencing Jurassic Park in this movie, and then reading it, and then realizing that all this playing I'm doing could go into actually creating something that other people could experience as well. So I got very interested in both writing and filmmaking at a pretty young age, and then just kept exploring, playing with those mediums uh, throughout high school, and then uh, studied uh, both writing and uh, filmmaking and theater uh, when I was in college, along with philosophy. I decided to, somewhere in there, I decided to cram philosophy in there as well. <laughs> mm. Just overachiever. A little bit. It was a, it was a bit ridiculous. Not in, <laughs> just for the record, not a straight A student by any means stretch yeah, of the imagination yeah. <laughs> i hear you i'm wondering at a young age that means at a young age you had the insight to understand the play you were doing was a story yeah how old were you at that time um i mean it was 
I'm, I, you know, it was probably, I mean, at that point, maybe 11, 12, somewhere in there. That, yeah, that, it's pretty insightful for 11, yeah. 12 years old. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, because it was, because I remember even just like, we would make these scenarios up and then we like almost had a series of like these characters and these different scenarios. And so there was this, this real sense of like we are telling these stories and and mm. so it was i don't know it was a it was a strange fun childhood <laughs> yeah. as you were talking i'm remembering that when i was a kid i also would write stories um both in class and just with my brother because we were just playing together all the time um, and even college i took a creative writing class nice so it, it sounds like we had that similarity but something in you drove you to say i want to make this a career as opposed to just this is a nice hobby that i have or a nice right. thing that i do <laughs> what was that drive what do you think made it say for you to say i want to do this all the time yeah i'm trying to think i mean cuz i knew pretty early on that i wanted to pursue that um i, I uh i, <laughs> I have a a, a hilariously sad memory uh of, of like pretty young age like having a conversation with one of my uncles and and making the comment of like yeah, I think maybe when i grow up i want to be like uh like a filmmaker and he's like filmmaker oh why not something more useful <laughs> uh, but uh and that always stuck with me then there's maybe some things i need to explore in therapy around that um sure. but uh, <laughs> but um but i remember you know pretty young like being like i i really want to go after this i think it was just because i i felt that it was there was something magical about it and i wanted to be part of that magic and i, I didn't i don't think i had the um the language and the understanding quite to uh, be able to fully grasp what what was so magical and interesting about it, but I knew that it was it was compelling and interesting, and you could do uh, like really take people into whole new worlds and experience things that you never experience otherwise um, through this uh, art, through this medium, whether written or on film. And um, so I knew that like that's like that sounds awesome like yeah i'd like to do that all the time <laughs> yeah you are an award-winning filmmaker like you literally won award win awards for your short films i'd love mm -hmm. to hear from you what's it called the whole act of producing art and being a creator is really being courageous because mm. you put yourself out there and you're putting your whole stuff out there open to everything like feedback criticism whatever it is yeah when you first started really getting into it, how did you manage that that uh, anxiety or, or mm. worry that may come up with that? Uh, you know, honestly, I I think I was naive. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, there's that like beginner's naivety, and and you just run with it. I remember reading an interview with Natalie Portman where she talked about taking on the role in in uh, Black Swan. And she had done some ballet, right, in, in, in the past. But she wasn't by no stretch a, a ballerina. But she she talks about, she talked about that in the interview of like this, like, naivety. That she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, I can totally do this. And then, of course, like, once she got into it, she was like, oh, my God, this is like so much harder than I ever imagined. But she's also she also clearly said, I, I'm glad I was naive enough to say yes, because had I known, I might have been too fearful. Mm. I might have been too anxious about it. And I wouldn't have taken on this role. And I'm really glad I did. And I, and, and I related to that a lot. And I think that's that's true probably of a lot of artists uh, that. There's that initial naivety. It's, it's the, to, to some degree the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So. You, you, in some ways, you assume you're better than you are, <laughs> and you just go make stuff. Uh, but I remember distinctly uh, experiencing making projects, like making a short film in in college, and then uh, showing it to people, you know, and then getting getting some good reactions, but also having that experience of where like things 
it change when you finally get into a room with other people and you actually watch it with other people um not to get mystical or anything like that but there is something the you know about the shared consciousness of of experiencing it together that does help you see your own creation through you know other people's eyes to a degree and so i began to see like oh yeah yeah like like i'm glad people are giving me compliments about some of the things but i see the gaps i'm starting to see like where this isn't as good and you know and there's always that you come back and then you look at the stuff that inspires you and you're like oh but that's so much better <laughs> you know <laughs> you like hold your stuff up side by side to like the stuff yeah. that you're inspired by and you're like this it doesn't even compare uh so i remember distinctly going through this phase of making something loving it sharing it not loving it as much hating it <laughs> and then by the like by the time it was it became a joke with myself and and my friends uh, in college that I was making a lot of films with, even post college, that by the time, because we were frequently making short films, we were like cranking on pretty like major short film projects, um, you know, uh, at least uh, a year apart, if not more, wow. uh, quickly. Wow. And um, so it became the running joke there that by the time we're like in pre production for the next one, we hate the previous one. <laughs> like, yeah. because because you know we see all the ways in which ah like that dialogue isn't very well written um you know that the those shots weren't great that maybe we should have picked a better location uh, you know like all those things start to come out and you start seeing the weaknesses and like ah oh, the third act is kind of flat and so you right you know you and it's a developmental thing of like trying and failing to a degree, but also succeeding. Uh, and I think I, I didn't, I didn't at the time understand this and I didn't um, until much later as I got to know more people who aspire to do these things that the, there was, I had great success in the sense that I completed a lot of projects mm. and, and yeah. over the years I, I met more and more people who would start things and then never finish them. And I was like, wait, people do that. <laughs> you mean you can, I'm, I, I don't understand that, but, uh, but the fact that I was kept doing that meant that, that I had the opportunity to grow. Um, so certainly like Did I you... have, you know, it's pretty terrible early short films. <laughs> so I definitely appreciate it. Um, so then in terms of storytelling, you know, what were some of those early mistakes you made in terms of telling a story and crafting a story? You know, I think uh, early on, I think understanding uh, the centrality of conflict. I didn't, I didn't really always understand how critical conflict is to every moment of, of a story. Uh, you know, certainly now as a guy who's like studied more of the neuroscience of storytelling and understanding like what it is about our brains that actually latch onto stories in the first place uh, and why that is important. And now I have a grasp of like, oh yes, you know, that conflict and how is this going to be resolved is really critical. So I think in those early days, not always understanding that about conflict clearly and how to then escalate it through a story. Um, was was tricky um but also i think one of the one of the biggest mistakes I, I made which i think is relatively common to a lot of new filmmakers when you're starting off and of course you only have the budget to if or maybe you don't even have a budget <laughs> at all so you only really have the ability to to make short films and uh but you spend all your time watching features. And so you understand a little more intuitively, not like overtly, because at that point, you know, still hadn't like really studied feature films, even their structure and their nature in depth. Uh, but there's that sense of like, you're experiencing this one sort of storytelling feature films, and then you're trying to go make a different 
sort of mm. story, a different sort of thing, which is short films and trying to miniaturize the structure of a feature film down into uh, a short mm. film, but then not really like, and ended up making, I made a lot of these, like what a, what a good friend of mine who was a, actually uh, collaborated on a lot of early film projects with, he would always refer to them as sort of no man's land projects because they're too long to really be a short film, but they're not nearly long enough to be a feature. And so good luck getting programmed in any festivals. <laughs> so I made a lot of those like 37 minute short film. Like what in the world? <laughs> Now, listen, you're blowing my mind. I would not even think that they're structured differently. Ah, ah. You know, what is, so what is the difference? Like, I don't understand. What is the difference right. between a feature film and a short film structure? Right. Um, I mean, if you boil it down to, like, real essential, like, beginning, middle, and end, well, yeah, sure. Like, even, even a joke has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sure, uh, but sure. there are some key ways in which... Um, you know, the the traditional feature film structure is like first 20 to 30 minutes is the first act where you get introduced to the world and the characters and, and to what the central problem of the story is, right? And you also get to know the character and maybe like what they're what they're struggling with or like, you know, kind of the way, what, what way do they need to grow? Yeah. And then you go through, like they, they make that choice and they, you know, take on the adventure as it were and you go through the second act which is uh the bulk of what the the movie is which is all the conflict and stuff and then reach that low point and then you know they either succeed or fail and, and you have the resolution which is the third act and short films differ significantly there because while they do have a beginning and a middle and an end, um, oftentimes uh, the end is almost, can almost in a lot of ways be non-existent. Like the third act, like I would argue most, most short films shouldn't, shouldn't have a third act. <laughs> mm. um, they should end, you know, one way or another, either like right at the end of act two or or they or right just after it but not have a true like resolution all that kind of stuff and in a lot of ways uh some of the most effective short films um don't even make it through the first act <laughs> oh, so so yeah my I, I probably i think my most popular short film as far as people who have seen it uh to date is uh Actually, no, because I think now playing with ice has exceeded it. But uh, so w the first short film line that really took off on the internet was a time travel, very quick short uh, called Stop. That was just a little project I made with my friend uh, Trevor Duke, and um, and it structurally where I would say it lands is it's essentially the start of a movie like the start of a story and you reach the inciting incident that's just where the problem is introduced you haven't even so you're in the first half of the first act of a story really where you just reach the 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 what the hell just happened moment mm -hmm. uh that would in a feature film propel you into the rest of the story and but it's the conclusion of our short film oh. you know so so a lot of really effective short films hit you with this moment that is going to have a huge impact, potentially a life-changing impact on the character. Mm. And then it leaves you to contemplate them. And so that, it, those are some of the most effective, I think, uh, short films. And so I would argue that's like kind of the, while there is kind of a miniature little beginning, middle, and end there, in the broader structure of understanding how you build a story, uh, it's a lot different than trying to create the resolution and especially the emotional catharsis that a feature film achieves and that was a, a, that was my biggest problem i would say early on in trying to make short films was i wanted that huge catharsis mm -hmm. of the feature mm -hmm. film and it's like ah but that's can you really do that effectively in in even a long short film you know in a 20 minute short film 
And it's like, well, maybe, but most likely not. <laughs> There's a reason why, like, the more you experience and you connect with characters and go through a journey with them, the bigger that mm -hmm. catharsis can be at the end. So that's so interesting. I never, now, now I'm going to have to think about every short film I've ever seen <laughs> and just watch them now with that lens. Yeah. Um, it, there are, you know, obviously, so there is exceptions to, to, to every such thing, but, but um, I mean, I, I ended up writing a book about, short films and making that observation especially in the in, in the transition into this digital world of being able to share things online where i really saw a lot of filmmakers make that shift in, where you know there were a lot more short films i think in the past that were they were 30 40 minutes and they were really in a, in a sense miniature feature films and then mm. came youtube and and yeah. And and it changed things, and and now we're on Instagram Reels and TikTok, and you know, yeah. and yeah. and the idea of like telling a story in a really concise way uh, shifted significantly, and mm -hmm. and that's where I really saw this move away from we're going to try to replicate in miniature the three act structure of a feature mm -hmm. film. I, I mean, I think this is, it, it resonates with me, I'm thinking, because, uh, you know, you and I are collaborating on this idea of leadership storytelling and creating right. a course and all that stuff around, around it. Um, and I see a lot of, I, I do see a lot of mistakes that other people make when they're doing storytelling in, in corporate or, you know, large groups is it, the story just meanders. It's too long. There's lots of extra details. Um, not dissimilar to, you know, a feature film yeah. trying to be a short film. Right, there's too many things going on, and it just makes it too bloated. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's back to that understanding what your central purpose is for the story. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you're when you're talking about writing a short story or, or writing a short film, it really comes back to it. It's got to hang on that. What's the central conflict, and how does it connect that? And so each moment, each scene, and each, even each line of dialogue, how does that support, uh, advance that, or or undermine it in some way? And um, and if it's not if it's not doing anything to really advance that or reveal something critical about the character, then it's fluff. It's yeah. it's waste <laughs> you know uh right. and and it need, it's gonna distract the audience and especially once you get into which we talked about on my podcast right the neuroscience of yeah. storytelling yeah, yeah, yeah. uh and we start understanding that engaging with information and taking in new information and even a story burns calories right like that in your brain's looking to conserve those calories and so you start throwing in all that extra information and it's not connected to the central conflict, which is the thing that your brain tuned into and was like, oh, I might be one day in a similar situation. I should pay attention to this mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just take notes because <laughs> maybe yeah. I want to see how this turns out. But if you start bogging the brain down with all this ancillary stuff that's not necessarily connected to it, brain's going to determine. But, well, you know what? On second thought, this isn't actually worth the investment of calories. I'm out. And yeah. and the same thing is going to happen whether you're if you're doing a presentation, you're doing a TED talk, you you know you're you're uh, even just discussing a particular project at a board meeting or something. And if you start meandering all over the place and and bringing in all these other things that don't relate to the the topic that we are really trying to get to the heart of right now then people are going to tune out and yeah. and and it's not their yeah. fault that's i think the most critical thing to understand is it's not their fault it's just how we're wired so once you understand that it's like hey it's not that people don't care it's just that you know get to the point <laughs> so i love that i i think that's that's really interesting i love the idea that everything every word should be towards that goal moving things forward it shouldn't be fluff yeah um i do want to push back though a little bit mm -hmm. i feel like sometimes you do want to add that fluff because 
whether it's maybe just like a funny anecdote or something that makes the audience laugh to build oh, sure. trust in you, even if it's not the ultimate goal of the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is the, the thing there is, is it serving a purpose, right? So that would be, that would be, I think the argument for, um, shoot, I'm going to forget his name now, but, uh, uh, the gentleman who wrote the book, save the cat, right? The, the argument for the classic save the cat or pet the dog scene early in the first act of a movie, does it add anything to the conflict is just to have, because what, what that's referring to is this moment where you see the main character do something like save a cat that's stuck in a tree or, you know, like pet a cute dog or something, you know, uh, keep someone from doing something mean to, to, to a puppy or something. And yeah, like it's not in the sense serving the conflict of the story, but what it is serving is creating emotional connection with the main character, you know, mm. so that we build rapport and we care. We build emotional investment of the audience into uh, the story so that now the conflict has stakes. We care about this character. Like, he, look, he's a nice guy. He saved that cat, right? It's funny. It's like, it's kind of cliche, but it's like, there's a real, like, emotion, basic emotional truth there that is, oh, like, we, we related. We felt that, you know, we, we can at least admire this person on some capacity mm -hmm. and therefore kind of care what happens. Now, now you introduce this big conflict in their life and it's like, oh, man, this, like, okay, I, I kind of got to see how, how this, does this work out for him? Or her building rapport in you know in public speaking and, and being able to connect meaningfully whether you're doing a, a lecture uh, or a presentation or, or you're actually teaching um, building that level of rapport uh, is is valuable now if you if you can always go too far right and you have like sure 30 minutes of cat saving in the beginning of your movie <laughs> like we're gonna we're gonna lose interest like <laughs> yeah yeah so there's always balance that we found yeah 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 so let's bring it all together i'd love to hear from you what's one thing that somebody can do to really improve their storytelling hmm one thing you know uh one thing that you can do to really improve your storytelling is to understand the relationship between each moment in your story. Um, this has been something that, that uh, it, like, it, I've only really heard it articulated this way recently. I went through a um, author boot camp um, with a co-author that I'm working on a, on a book with. And, um, and they, they talked about this idea that, that really was first pioneered, I guess, or, or sort of made famous by the guys who, who run South Park. And, and uh, what's it? Uh, uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone. Matt Stone, yeah. Yeah. And so they have this rule where they can never use, they can never describe the flow of their story for an episode using the words and then that is a a like the 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 cardinal rule there they, they it's like a major sin cannot use and then because the issue with and then is that there is no conflict in and then there's in fact no causal relationship with and then mm. you know i was a guest on your podcast and then i went to bed there's no causal relationship between those things right um but what they do is they say every scene has to be connected with either but or therefore so what they do is instead of connecting with uh you know and then it has to be connected with either but or therefore so something happens therefore th it, you know there are consequences to whatever it is that's happened in this scene therefore that led to this so there's a causal relationship or there's a reversal there's a flip there's a surprise which is they they did this but 
this happened instead. Mm. And so that, and that, and you know, can amp up the conflict. Uh, but either way, there's a causal thing because either there was a consequence to a choice or there was an effort made that was thwarted which is in itself like oh you know like it's it's that's part of storytelling you think about all the movies you watch and like you think the act the second act is like the hero trying stuff trying stuff trying stuff failing and and it doesn't work and it doesn't quite work and maybe something succeeds but it's it's not enough you know um that's all all those scenes are they do this but this happens <laughs> you know so I think if more people understand that, like really be conscious that if you're describing even even just like something that you're trying to use in, in a in a teaching moment, in a presentation, and you find yourself describing, okay, so it was th this happened and then this happened and then oh, like watch for those words and really examine is it really and then, or is even what you're and then and thening important to the story or is it you know or is it really causally connected to what's going on or is that just stuff that's like look it sounds important to you it's like the classic situation of oh you know i so this thing happened to me i think it was last spring no it, there were there were leaves the leaves were changed so it can't have been spring nobody cares <laughs> Like, get, like, what's the thing that happened to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. that that's a way to guard with that. I think is a really helpful uh, thing to to connect your moments with but or therefore. Yeah, and see if it makes I sense. I love that. I love that because it goes back to what you were just saying just recently about how everything, every word, every sentence should really serve the story and serve the goal and purpose of that. Right. So it's, it, it, and if you find yourself doing that, you're, it's going to, it's going to naturally happen. Yeah. Cause everything that you're doing is, is now still connected to that central idea, that central conflict that the story is really supposed to be all about. Uh, where often what happens with, and then is it's easy to start slipping in these scenes and these ideas that you have that mm. somehow seem important but don't actually connect and you're too close to it to recognize it. But somebody else coming and reading the manuscript or watching the movie is like, what's that? Like, no. wh yeah. why did the character go to the grocery store? Why did we need to see that? Like it didn't, it didn't connect with anything, <laughs> you know, like, well, this is great. I love this stuff. Um, obviously this is why we get along because we're yeah, right. talking about this stuff and just really thinking about stories. So I'd love to have you back in the future to dive deeper and talk more about this. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure. Really enjoyable. Anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to advertise or plug to the people? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to just find out more about my work, uh, I my website is michaelwhistler.com. I spell it really funny. It's M-I-K-E-L-W-I-S-L-E-R.com. And there you can, you know, see... Um, my podcast blog uh links to uh, i've got a couple novels out uh, and i've got a got another one coming out soon actually based on that short film stop that we talked about earlier mm. um and uh yeah and, and my book short films 2.0 uh where i also really dive into uh this thinking around how uh, the structure of short films differs from feature films uh all the links are there uh, and, uh, otherwise, um, you know, if you happen to be a science fiction, uh, short story reader, uh, want to check out a free story, there's, you know, um, the, uh, podcast, uh, Starship Sofa, uh, has, uh, one of my short stories called, uh, Falling Sunward. Uh, so if you just look that up on, on, uh, Starship Sofa, uh, that'll come up and it's, you know, low risk, it's free. So you can check it out for free. Um, otherwise, you know, have a new story coming out soon in, in um, uh, Dark Horses magazine. So uh, that'll actually be the short story that that the latest short film I made, Subscribed, is based on. And uh, yeah, hoping we're hoping to get distribution for that soon. So we're currently doing festivals 
and uh, it's just picked up a couple awards. Um, so that nice. that's been really cool uh, to get that that recognition. Um, just won uh, best of fest short uh, at uh, Shaanxi Film Festival, mm-hmm. and playing at uh, Brooklyn Sci Fi, which is an online festival. So if you happen and wherever you happen to be checking this out, you know um, you can always take a look at that as well and potentially see if it's playing there. And I will say, even though I'm biased because I'm in the film, I do right. think it's a good short film. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Apparently, a couple other people thought so too, and you know, got yeah. to come yeah, home a with couple of others. Um, so I'm just going to wait for the time when you make a short film or a book about me as as the lead character. So yeah, I'm going to wait okay. for that. Yeah, well, we, we're going to make your biopic. Yeah, yeah. Is it a short? I, I would really love Michael B. Jordan to play me in that biopic. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. I mean, yeah, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, thanks for being here. Appreciate you talking with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.